Rightio, well, g'day guys, welcome back for another one. Today's focus is going to be installing this Torquet three and a half inch system. So she rocked up yesterday. Um, I took it all out of the package yesterday. I didn't do any filming. Uh, there was a lot of noise about the place yesterday, so I didn't even worry about attempting to film any of this. As you can see, that's the package it came in. So very well protected, which is nice, I suppose. Um, look, this looks like a nice system. I'm gonna run through it. Let's check it out. So obviously I decided to go with the Torker 3.5 inch system. Like I said, it looks pretty good. Overall, I'm fairly happy with it and I'm sure it's gonna look really nice under the vehicle and hopefully give us a nice sound. Now, coming in at roughly $2,000, it's definitely not a cheap system. So is it worth it? Well, as you can see, a lot of this welding, attention to detail and fabrication work is beautiful. There's no doubt. There is a couple of welds that are a bit off to me, like right here looks like there's some pinholes, for example, and some of this welding looks a bit undercut. Well, I'm here. Look, look what I just bought from Bunnings. Got myself a creeper. They don't even give you any hardware to fit the casters to the thing. So lucky I've got my own stuff in the shed here. But yeah, it's a bit rough. Rightio, so first things first, take off these four nuts, holding this rear tailpipe section on. Right, so we keep heading along the pipe, basically from the rear there, undoing mounts, nothing exciting. Here you get the picture. Now while I'm under here, I'm just gonna show you probably going to be hard to show you and hard for you guys to see but as you'll know from a previous video I replaced the standard diff lock actuator guard with this GSL one see how it's bent here you can't really see but it's been slammed by a rock or something and been pushed in this is why I do this this is a good guard it's a lot more solid than the standard one but it, it's done its job, so so this is good. Um, I'll, I'll probably leave it. It's you know it's still there. It's still doing what it should be doing, but it's done its job. So it's definitely been hit by something hard. And you might remember, like I said on my previous Hiluxes, I had the standard guards in, uh, hit some big rocks and stuff, and push the standard guard back in and totally. Um, smash the diff lock actuator and then it's a whole new diff carrier that's got to go in like three thousand dollar job so i see a, most rigs getting around with these standard guards I, I don't know how people aren't damaging them but i do it all the time so definitely a, a required mod in my opinion anyway so i can start undoing the first Flange. I've just got myself a uh, breaker bar for a bit more leverage to crack these. Right, so I bug it up. That flange you see right there, I've cracked the two bottom nuts, the top nut. I put a socket on it and I thought I was on it properly, but I wasn't. I've rounded it. Um, I can't get it undone, so I'm just going to have to chuck the grinder on it. Bit rough, but it is what it is, my mistake. Um, yeah, so we'll lock that off, but that's all right. It's not really a big deal. It's easy enough to get to it. We'll chop it off and get on with it. Now, it'll be a lot easier to do this on a hoist or chuck your car on, up on some stands. Um, it'd be easier if this, had a, if this rig had a lift, but it still doesn't. But this is okay. I actually chopped the back end of this tailpipe off because it was just too hard to get out like this as you know this is the part that sits back here the tail tailpipe piece i actually chopped it off because trying to get this mount past all this while it's still connected to that with this mount and this muffler in the way trying to get it through that little bit back there and over the diff bit of a mission when you're on the ground Maybe it's doable, I don't know. But anyway, it's no big deal. This exhaust system's not going back in. It's the old stuff, so it really doesn't matter. We've taken all the old exhaust pipe out. 
not too bad of a job. Look, this is all relatively simple. It's just a exhaust pipe install. It's not very challenging, but as always, I ended up pulling out more tools than you should really need. Just a few nuts that didn't want to come undone, and then I rounded that one nut and had to grind it off, and just a little bit of mucking around. Anyway, so we'll start with the in install of the new Torquid exhaust. First cab off the rank, which I couldn't find any information about this on the internet. Very interesting. Cut the fuel lines where indicated in yellow below, which you'll see right here. So when I opened up this box yesterday and I started looking at everything and I had a brief read of the instructions just to see what was going on, ready for the install today. I certainly didn't expect that. And I didn't, I, like I said, I didn't, I've watched a couple of videos, obviously, of exhausts on the on YouTube and, and whatnot, as you do, trying to figure out which exhaust you think is the best, what sounds the best, etc. Uh, so that's a surprising step. So I jumped under there yesterday to have a look because I didn't really, I thought surely you don't have to cut fuel lines, like wouldn't they just, route it in the same spot as the standard exhaust, but apparently not. Now, I don't know if this is the same across all the 70 series variants, or if it's just the 79. Um, a couple of the videos I did find on YouTube for installs were for set the 78 for the Troopy, and the blokes didn't show any cutting of fuel lines or mention it at all. So I've got a feeling maybe, I don't know, but maybe it's just the single cab, because it's the only variant that got the update in 2016 with the airbags and it's got a bit, bit of a different chassis under it. The, all the other 70 series variants have the old chassis. This has got a bit of an upgraded chassis. So I don't know if maybe the fuel lines are routed different on this model. I'm not too sure. But anyway, we got to cut the fuel lines and reroute them, so let's do it. So we're under the vehicle. Basically, we got to cut this fuel line about here and this one are roughly about here. And then we go under here, under this cross member. And we gotta cut these two roughly here and roughly here. And then what happens is they give you some fuel hose, fuel line, whatever you wanna call it, which then you route through here, through this cross member. So instead of going over, we go through and then that exhaust fits over here. And they actually give you a another mount, exhaust mount that you attach here somewhere for the exhaust to be mounted to. So the standard exhaust sort of came through here. I don't know why they don't just route it the same, but they haven't, so let's get into it. So I've just got myself one of these tools, little pipe cutter to do the job. If you're gonna do this, take off, take these pipes out of all these little clamp mounts along the chassis, like as many as you can. I've done the ones up here as well, because then it just gives you a lot, there's not much room to film under here, but it just gives you a hell of a lot more freedom and movement to try and, because you've got to get this little thing in on these pipes to cut them. So you're gonna to wanna to do that. Now this is cool, I can probably do um, most of this from sitting where I am, which is good. So I should be able to get the back of these lines, so behind this cross member where I just showed you, and then also here where I've got to cut them, which is a lot, I think it's gonna be a lot better than laying down trying to do it. Listen, if you've got a hoist or something, this this will be, so much easier. Um, it's good because these cruisers, there's a lot of room under here. Um, like I said before, it'd be a lot better if this was lifted, but it's not, so it is what it is. And most of us out there are probably just gonna have a shed floor to work on, so it just is what it is. But uh, So I'm glad I can sit up in here. But anyway, that's enough yipping and yapping. Let's try and get these bloody fuel lines cut. I'm a bit... Um, apprehensive to do this obviously because obviously you want to do it and you want to get it right and then you know 
start your car up and drive off. I don't really want any complications, but I mean, it's like it, it's relatively simple. But you know, oh, let's do it. Look, just before I get started, I'm gonna cut these two that are behind this cross member. It's gonna be really hard for me to film this, so I don't think I will. What I will do, I'll show you after I've done it, but what I will do is film the cutting of these two for you. So I think that should be okay. You'll get the gist. It's the, it's the same thing, it's just behind this cross member, but I'll show you these ones once I've done them. All right, so I just cut the first one. Now, obviously you're gonna have a bit of diesel come out of these lines so get yourself a little bucket ready like I have and I've got rags and stuff so I haven't really made a mess so now that the first one's cut it's just that initial just seems like what the hell is this really what I have to do but anyway now that the first one's cut pretty straightforward and uh, I knew it would be it's just a little bit freaky but uh anyway so I'll get this other one cut and then like I said I'll show you these ones up here all right I'm finally ready I've got these two cut these two pipes back here and just deburred them so basically we just work this around and as we go around go around once or twice and then tighten her up tighten this little knob up and then we can go around again once or twice you'll feel as you go around it's like biting in and try, kind of hard to cut I usually go around twice I'm not trying to rush anything you know a little bit scary so there you go, there's that piece that's now out of the equation. So all you're doing, you're basically putting it back how it was, you're just rerouting it. That's all we're doing here folks, just rerouting it. I actually like to keep a lot of stuff like this. Like I won't keep these bits obviously, but these fuel line flexi bits here and these clamps I'll probably keep. There's always, um, you know, little jobs and stuff you can use them on. What I have been doing as well, like it's not in the instructions or anything, I've got this little deburring tool here. Basically go around the inside of the pipe with this, just to take any burrs off. I don't really want any anything left in the line, but I don't really want any restrictions, any burrs or any restrictions that shouldn't really be there. Just a light deburr, nothing too crazy. It's a very little very handy little tool this actually so it's just got a couple of rollers a couple of rollers this end and a little sharp wheel here and as you work it around it just gradually slices into the fuel line so let me know in the comments if you knew you had to do this or if you thought you had to do this I certainly didn't I actually had a bloke message me on Instagram the other day say, saying that I'm basically the guinea pig for him because he's got one of these like brand new and wants to do a few mods and so he's basically looking at what I'm doing and seeing like my opinions on things and what works, what doesn't, stuff like this for example. A lot of people hanging out to see this 3.5 inch torquid exhaust installed and what it takes to install it and you know, the, if it doesn't make a glorious sound or not. That's the other thing, obviously, as we all know, everything's got DPFs now, so, you know, these things aren't gonna sound, you can't get them to sound as good as they once used to. And that's just the way it is. Obviously, you can delete your DPF, I'd love to, I wish it didn't have a DPF, but it's illegal and it's just, you know, it's illegal. People have been caught. I was reading stories last night, actually. And people have definitely been caught, been fined. I read one story of a bloke that got busted, paid a 10 grand fine or whatever it is, and then also had to repurchase all the stuff from Toyota, like the DPF and everything like that. And they aren't cheap. You're looking at thousands of dollars, literally thousands. But there are high flow DPFs out there. G GSL make a high flow one and it actually sounds very nice. So what do you think so far? Have I scared you off from buying one of these or what? The actual fuel pipe, whatever you want to call it, has a, has a plastic sheath around it, which is this stuff here. 
So we need to cut about 30 millimeters of this away to expose the fuel line. And then that's where those flexi lines I've got will hook onto. Basically to do this, I'm just cutting around the pipe just with a standing knife, just like scoring it. And then I just do a, a nice cut down here, not deep. And then I can peel that plastic layer off. So I've cut this one. And basically we just peel this off like I was saying. There's a little plastic sheath bit. We need to install the new fuel lines with the new hose clamps and route it through the cross member just here. Poke through here, this other end, bit of an elbow and we'll bend around and fit on the fuel line back behind this cross member. But it's a bit long, they give you a bit of length. We'll start by cutting probably half off that I reckon. Now I've got a pair of these all purpose shears, they do a bloody good job so we'll use these. You could use a Stanley knife or something but these, these are just real good at cutting anything really. Nice neat cut, look at that. Alright, I've had a good bit of a look, I reckon we'll cut just a little bit less than half off this end. No rush doing this, we just want to make sure we get this right, you know. Alright, so I've pretty much trimmed it up to where I'm happy. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to take these old clamps off the fuel line and use them as well. They give you these hose clamps in the torque kit. But I reckon I'll use these as well as put these back on next to this. Just double the clamping, why not use them, you know? Onto here. Alright, so I've just trimmed up this small one as well. What I'm trying to achieve here as I trim them and test fit is trying to avoid the hoses sitting up against hard against the cross member. So if I can get them sitting and just floating in there, that's good, so they're not touching. These hoses are, seem like good quality and I'm sure they're fine and whatever, but and I could also put some spiral wrap or something around these, which is what you see on like the truck airlines and stuff like that. So I'll probably do that anyway, but just for now, I'm just trying to fit them nicely so they don't rub or anything. There's not enough pipe to put this on, but that's all right. It's gonna be fine. So I'll just put these pipes back in where they're supposed to sit. That one's home. This one's home. That's where they sit nice and snug. So this is what we're looking at. I've just put the fuel lines back in their little housings along the uh, cross member here. But this is what I was doing. So this is the back side of this cross member where I'm sitting and you couldn't really see what I was doing. So this is what I was doing back here. These pipes are back home where they live in this little mount here. And as you can see, these pipes come round and go through this hole instead of over the top like they were. Pretty happy with that. I will get some spiral wrap in the end. They are touching a little bit. That's, I'm not worried. I'm, I'll get some spiral wrap to put around them and they'll be protected, they'll be fine. Now we can actually bloody fit the exhaust. The whole bit we came here for. The whole reason you guys are here. So uh, that was interesting. Nonetheless, let's get it fitted. So the next thing we gotta do Thank God the fuel line saga is over. Um, is we got to install this little bad boy here, which goes in behind the cross member where I was just sitting. I'll show you. Rightio, so I've got the little uh, stainless steel bracket here, and it fits somewhere like that behind this cross member, just where these fuel lines are. So basically, you got that little knob there that's supposed to go in that hole. And then this hole lines up with that rectangle and you put a bolt through there. So we use the original mounts onto here using the original hardware. You're supposed to use the original hardware, right? Well, look at that. That's the width of these slotted holes they've done in this mount. The, these nuts only just bite on. That's no good. So I'm gonna have to probably get, chuck a couple of washers on there, I reckon. Rightio, so the next job is to take the DPF out and chuck it in the bin. So we'll get onto that now. Just tricking. Just tricking, don't get your bloody panties in a knot.
That's it right there, bolt it to the back of the DPF. Get on with the next step. So now we'll chuck a, one of the original rubber mounts back in here and also hook the oxygen sensor up to the new exhaust. Okay, so what we'll do next is we'll hook up this tailpipe section to the, or intermediate section to the muffler section or whatever they call it. So we've got a gasket and some fresh hardware. Gasket in, three bolts, nuts, pretty simple. Rightio, well, she's all in. So basically what we'll do now is work from the front to the back. So starting on the back of the DPF and work our way back, tightening everything up. Just make sure, basically want to tighten everything up and make sure it's sitting happy. May need to do a bit of an adjustment, but you know, we don't want it touching the chassis anywhere or the body. Moment of truth. Let's, uh, the moment we've been all waiting for. Let's crank it up. I, we'll start it up. I'm not expect, I'm honestly not even expecting much of a difference in noise just sitting here idling. Because you've got to remember, I've had a 2008 straight through system that I eventually actually cut. I made my own system for it and it popped out just behind the cab. The side exit, it was extremely loud. But uh, with the DPF and everything, I really don't know what to expect of this. So we'll just, let's see. Now don't get me wrong, it obviously sounds nowhere near as good as pre-DPF, but I'm pretty happy with that. And she's looking pretty nice sitting under there. Look at all the bloody tools and stuff I ended up with. You're not supposed to have half this stuff. Anyway. Rightio guys, well I'm just uh, out bush. A couple of days since fitting the exhaust. I just wanted to drive around with it for a bit before actually like putting the video out there. But she sounds bloody good at idle. It's a bit of a windy day. I want to try and get some um, drive-bys of the exhaust, like as much as I can. Go through the gears, maybe find a sand hill to drive up, give you guys a bunch of different looks.
final verdict, or final thoughts on this exhaust and the whole process of fitting it? Well, I'd definitely like to hear what you guys think about how it sounds, just in general what you guys think of it. I'll just say straight off the bat, like I said before, it ain't no pre-DPF model and it ain't no straight through system. It's never gonna sound as good. There's some out there that just sound incredible, some of the V8s getting around, and that's it just is what it is. Now, you, you could go the whole route of deleting your DPF. I'd love to do that. I'd absolutely, I'd love to delete that DPF and just put a straight through stainless system on it, and, but it's illegal. And look, you, you will get caught out sooner or later. Like I said before, I've read stories of it happening. It's just not really the way to go about it, you know? Now you could go the route of putting a high performance, high flow DPF in the system, something like a GSL, but I did actually email them. They actually gave me a call today. I actually had a, I had a really good chat with them on the phone and basically they're not doing their high flow DPF systems anymore or at the moment. Won't go into too much detail, that's, that's their business. But yeah, that, I had, did have a good chat with them. It was, it, was, it was actually really good to talk to them, but they're not actually doing those systems at the moment. So maybe somewhere down the track, that could be a possibility. I've even actually been looking into if there's any way to remove the DPF legally. And not just for the sound and performance and lower EGTs and all the benefits and probably better fuel economy. There's so many benefits, but also because of the risk of fire outbush. It has happened before. Now, my previous two Hiluxes obviously had DPS. The first time I was out bush and I had a DPF burn, I was so scared. I literally thought I was about to burn my car down and be stranded out there and burn half the station. I, pull, I didn't notice it driving. I actually pulled up, jumped out of the car and I could smell it. You would swear there was a bushfire. It, it was the strongest smell and I could see a bit of smoke. I freaked out jumped out of the car, grabbed my fire extinguisher, opened the bonnet and I was trying to look around, I was trying to find where the DPF even was. And it turned out there was actually no grass built up anywhere. It was just cow poo, dry cow poo, which is grass obviously, caked in and around the exhaust and like where, and where the DPF was. And it was smoking a little bit. So I got in under there and got rid of it and it was smoking hot under there, like boiling hot. It's really wild how hot the systems actually get. So ever since then, I've been very wary of it, and I've, I just hate that. They're not a good thing for that, that kind of work, even if, especially if you're in the long grass in spin effects or something, like there is a fire danger there. So I've actually been looking into legal ways of getting like some kind of an exemption or something, but I need to do more research. I haven't done much research, and it does seem very hard, and it seems like it would only be, it's for primary producers and, you know, the def defence force, that kind of thing. Like I said, I haven't really looked into it and I don't, I, I don't really think it's possible. But anyway, this is just what it is now with these DPFs. And, but as far as, I think that it does sound good. To, it doesn't sound bad. Um, it just is what it is and that's just the way it is these days. But to be able to get an exhaust like that and fit it, I, I honestly think it sounds pretty good. And even in the recordings, I thought the recordings were going to be pretty crappy and that they're a lot better than I thought. Now, is it worth it? Is the Torquet 3.5 inch system worth it? Look, it's about two grand. They've got a sale on right now, or maybe it's finished by the time this gets uploaded, 15% off. So I actually got a pretty decent deal. That's what made me actually buy the bullet and buy the exhaust right now. I wasn't going to do that, but because it was on sale, I figured that wasn't going to come around again. Look, there is systems, you can go on eBay right now and pick up a stainless system or a mild steel system for like 400 bucks. But the thing is, this is a beautiful system. It does look very nice, let's be honest. And it comes with a 10 year warranty. So when I'm looking at stuff, my vehicle gets worked hard and I'm gonna be keeping it for a long, long time. That's the plan. I like to try, you know, try and put good gear on it where I can. I don't always buy the best of the best, like there's an XTM drawer right here. As you've seen, I've fitted one to my canopy. It's cheap. I think I paid not even $300 each for these drawers. 
and they seem solid to me, they seem like they're going to last. So I don't always have to buy the best of the best. Um, but with something like this, I don't, I don't want to get under the car in a year and start my crack out, and then it's just a problem you've got to deal with. So at the time, look, and it depends on your budget. There's nothing wrong with spending 400 bucks on an exhaust. If that's what you've got to work with, that's what it is. There's a reason why brands like Kings are successful, you know what I mean? Not everyone's got their own budget and I fully understand that. But like I said, if you go and buy a $400 exhaust and then it cracks out in a year, that's just not ideal. So the 10 year warranty is definitely a peace of mind. Like I said, there was a few things that I was a bit, little bit iffy with, with this exhaust. It could just be me being very picky, a couple of the worlds and whatnot. But look, it all went in smoothly and I didn't even have to adjust any of it. It's not touching the chassis or the body anywhere. It's all very nice. It looks very good. So overall, I'd have to say I'm happy with it. Now, I'm sure you're wondering if it's made any difference to power, how, how that feels. To be honest, it does feel a bit more responsive, but I don't know if that's just me thinking that. It's not that loud, so it's not like it sounds like it's more powerful, but it just feels a little bit more responsive, but it's not like it's had a tune. So, you know, it's not getting any more air or fuel, which is what you need for more power. So I don't, I don't know about that. Fuel economy, funnily enough, I've, as far as the trip computer reckons in the rig, it's, it's been sitting on 15.4 litres per 100 for weeks now. That's where it's settled after almost 35,000 kilometres. I did 600 Ks in the rig yesterday and it's gone up to 15.5 from 15.4. Funnily enough, so if anything, it's gotten worse, but I don't think that's, that's probably just me putting the boot into it a bit more, trying to really test this exhaust and get the sound out of it and whatever. That's, I don't think that really means anything, to be honest. One last thing before we go, I didn't know whether to put it in this video or not, but I thought, why not? It occurred while filming this video. So I'll put a clip in right now. <laughs> Sounds to me like they're not going to cover it under warranty, which doesn't shock me at all. I wasn't expecting it to be covered under warranty because the first thing they said to me was, oh, you've put bigger tyres on. Basically, I said to them that it better be covered. I expect it to be covered. I spend so much money with you guys and it's a work vehicle. The clutch shouldn't give out like that. I don't care if I put bigger tyres on it. I understand their position, but at the same time, that's weak. It should do better than that. I haven't even, it's not like I'm towing a three ton work trailer around or anything like that with it, you know. Um, but that's just the service manager and he said, look, it's not up to me. All we can do is take it out, take the photos of it, send it away and see if they will warrant it. But they're going to want to know what tyres are on it, if you've done an exhaust, which I just did. So I understand that. So anyway, I'll stick with me as this unfolds further because I'm going to make a video solely but just on that subject on whether there's a warranty or not and how they go about handling that. Uh, another part of me though, even if they do warrant it, I'm kind of thinking, is there any point putting the weak factory clutch back in? Why not go a heavy duty clutch? Because it's probably just going to happen again. So I don't know if it's, it might just be a waste of time going, going down that route. I did speak to a mechanic who reckons the clutches on the DPF models are a lot better than they used to be. And he was saying that you can even give them a light tune and they're fine. So I don't know what's happened. Always out bush doing a lot of bush work. I'm going to start camping, making videos, go full drive, going full driving and stuff like that. So I need it now and I need it to be reliable. I've got to head out bush soon and I, you know, it's going to take a few days to get this clutch sorted and fixed and whatever, but I've got to do trips in the meantime. So I don't get stranded somewhere. I think it'll be okay. I've just got to go steady with it. So another thing, the warranties are always a funny thing, hey? I was talking to the mob at Toyota the other day, like the service manager and whatever, and he was telling me, like I was asking him if they still fit diesel secondary filters and whatnot, because they used to do it. And uh, you know, you can get a lot done through the dealers. He said, we don't anymore and you'll void your warranty. 
catch cans, filters. Now, I know that's not entirely true because you can't just void a warranty off a, off a filter, you know? It's, uh, and I mean, because well, they talk about the fact that you can have problems with the fuel system being too restricted with, with two filters. You've got to get the micron rating right with the filter and whatnot. But it's just interesting. This is one of those things where, what do you do with your vehicle? How many people buy four wheel drive and keep it stock? Obviously there's some do, people in cities and maybe you go to the beach once a month or whatever, but it's it's a four wheel drive. You're gonna, if you're gonna buy a four wheel drive and use it for its intended purpose, four wheel driving, going out bush, hitting up a dirt road, whatever, you're gonna do stuff. You're gonna put a bull bar. You're gonna maybe give it a lift because the factory suspension's no good. It doesn't last long. Once you put weight, there's all these things that you're gonna do, and that's just the way it is. So, the whole thing with the DPF, they're they're considered a serviceable item. So it's something that I think about and I worry about. Like, when's this DPF gonna give up? And then I'm up for thousands of dollars just to replace epoxy DPF, which shouldn't even be in the system anyway. And I wish it wasn't there. The day that that comes. I'm not going to want to replace that DPF. I'll just say that. Anyway, that'll do for this video. I hope you like it. Take it easy. Have a good one and we'll see you next time. Cheers.